My name is Martin Kalfadovic. I'm the Associate Director for Digital Services at Smithsonian Libraries. And today we're going to talk a little bit about our Smithsonian Research Online and its relationship to a number of national initiatives, including the OSTP policy on open data. But we're also going to be doing a bit of a history lesson today. There won't be a test afterwards, but I want everyone to sort of, sort of see where the Smithsonian fits into this larger federal context in terms of the OST mandate and open access. So um, the Smithsonian Institution was founded at the um, bequest of James Smithson, who was an English scientist, who after a series of complicated um, things, um, left his entire estate to the United States to found in Washington an institution under the name of the Smithsonian, an establishment for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And it's these two missions, the increasing of knowledge and the diffusion of knowledge, that we're rolling into a lot of our Smithsonian research online and how that all fits together. So an important part of the founding of the Smithsonian was the plan of organization for the institution. This is Joseph Henry that you see on the screen, who is the first secretary or leader of the Smithsonian. And under his guidance, one of the things for the formation of the institution was that it would comp be comprised of a library, a museum, and a gallery of art, together with all of the different things associated with those things. So again, from the beginning, the Smithsonian was related to all of these different aspects. It was also important that there would be no restriction on the type of things that would be covered under this. So it's art, science, history, literature was actually included in this original um, founding documents. We don't really do as much on that as we um, would under that organization. Also in this founding document was a library, and our first librarian was Charles Coffin Jewett. There was a lot of little political and personal things that happened over the years, and the library was sort of um, um, shunted aside a bit at the beginning, but it all came back in full force in later years. And again, one of the key things for the library was the gathering of documents related to the mission of the institution. Now here's the important part. Uh, many people feel the Smithsonian is a federal institution, and although the bulk of our funding comes from the federal government, we're actually a trust instrument of the United States people that's jointly governed by the Congress, the executive office, the legislative branch, and citizen regents. So although we are not technically a federal agency in any sense of the word, we do try to adhere to many of the different federal policies and procedures that the federal government puts out. So under the, in the um, context of the OST mand OSTP mandate, we're actually uh, um, complying out of will as opposed to force of law. So the Smithsonian has a, a number of museums and the National Zoo. My slides didn't seem to get updated on this network. There's actually, um, depending on how you count, 19 museums and galleries or 15 museums and galleries, depending on how you're counting the different portions, and the National Zoo. We also have research institutes. The Smithsonian Libraries is one of the research institutes, as well as these other elements that you see on the screen, including the archives, et cetera. So it's, there's the museums that are the more public component, and then the research things that happen more behind the scenes. We also have a number of research centers. Um, this number should say um, 16. And th these are all the different study centers that are created at the Smithsonian to do very specific projects. And all of these activities that are going through the museums, the research institutes, and the research centers are all generating the type of research that we are collecting within the Smithsonian Research Online and then distributing and making available through those different mechanisms. <coughs> So from the very beginning, the Smithsonian was also focused on publishing the outcomes of the research. Um, what you see on the screen is the very first Smithsonian publication, which was a, in a series called Smithsonian Contributions to Knowledge. And it was actually on the mound, mounds of Central in the Midwest area. And so this was the outcome of research done on the early burial mounds and other um, archeological sites of the Midwest. 
We also, as the years went by, had a number of other Smithsonian publications. Again, part of this was many of these were published by the General Printing Office in later years. So these are some of the major series of Smithsonian publications that were issued from the mid um, 19th century onwards. Many of these were all published by the GPO, so in this case they're actually federal documents. And again, so all of the things that go along with federal documents accrue to these publications. In the 1960s, um, those publications sort of faded off and we created a new series of publications called the Smithsonian Contribution Series. These are the most of those. They're, they have, new ones have come and gone over the years, but this is sort of the bulk of those Smithsonian Contribution Series. These are all published by the Smithsonian Institution Scholarly Press currently, and we've been working very closely with the press at the libraries over the last few years, building the website, making all of these available digitally on, at the point of publication. So as these are published in print and distributed through the Federal Deposit Library System, they're also available freely available online through that same process. So what we wanted to do a number of years ago was create a system where we could track the scholarly output of the institution. And this actually was started with the help of the Smithsonian Institution Natural History Botany Department, which had been tracking their publications over the years. The library took over the management of the bibliography of Smithsonian research for botany and then expanded it to the rest of the science unit. Um, our director, Nancy Gwynn, who happens to be in the audience today, worked very closely with our undersecretary for science to convince them that the best way to do our equivalent of promotion and tenure, which is called PAEC, would be to um, use this bibliography as the source for that data for all of that. That was then expanded to include also our history, art, and culture units. The Smithsonian Research Online was built to include a number of different systems and services that would provide the access to that information as well as reports and services that would then flow back. So the Smithsonian Research Online is comprised of two main portions at the moment. There's a research bibliography that has a little over 73, maybe 74,000 titles in it right now and then the digital repository, which is a more traditional institutional repository element with about 20,000 objects in that. I'd said earlier that the Smithsonian encompasses all different types of research, but of course, um, within the um, quantity of scientific publications, science does tend to dominate. So here are just some recent statistics that show the breakdown between science, history, art, and culture, and then our publications from the United States National Museum. So again, as you can see, science dominates the research output of the Smithsonian as it does with our budget. So this is showing the, the um, quantity of publications from each of the different museums or research institutes at the Smithsonian. Um, basically, you can ignore those small numbers. So here's the key part, which basically shows that the primary output are, again, coming from our large science um, units at the Smithsonian, the National Museum of Natural History, the Environmental Research Center, the Astrophysical Observatory, and the Tropical Research Institute. So the key thing here, again, is that for a compilation of the content within the bibliography, working within the science is much easier because, again, most of that comes from web of science and related things. And at the Smithsonian, the research output of history and art and culture is much more complicated. Um, one in our Center for Folk Life, one of the scholarly outputs are liner notes on CDs that are created from the Folkways project. That's the kind of thing that doesn't usually make its way into most online bibliography, so we have to manually gather a lot of that information. This is just another representation, again, of that same information showing, again, science, which is green in our, in our world, is very large. Over the course of, we started in about 2008, gathering the information for the Smithsonian Research Online. And you can see the growth of the content over the years as, again, more of our Smithsonian units came online to participate in the Smithsonian Research Online. And the big bump there is when we did a retrospective conversion and gathered a whole bunch of early publications. And again, this shows, again, how that content acquisition comes in through alerts, et cetera. I'm not touching any. Oh, and the, the important thing is actually how the data is reused on a regular basis by our different Smithsonian researchers and administrators. So again, this is a one-stop shop 
So what we don't want to do is have researchers either have to enter data or gather information in numerous places. So by compiling it all within the Smithsonian Research Online, all of that data can be repurposed back out to the different web pages. So the example we see here is, uh, this is botany. So our botany department web page for each of the researchers can just use, uh, we're now using JSON scripts to pull the information from SRO and to populate those individual researcher pages. You can also do the same for departments or a whole museum. It's also an important tool for our administrators to report back. So here we just see some charts and graphs that are showing how we can output this for the administrators at the Smithsonian so that they can report back up to Congress and their other constituencies the type of research that's being done. We also calculate um, number of covers of science and nature magazines so that we can actually say there were 12 covers of nature in the last three years with Smithsonian authors on them. And this is just some statistics on use showing where those different users are coming from. And again, usage by the different Smithsonian Museum content. So again, science, again, is highly the most popular. We're also working with altmetrics and some of the other new ways of measuring usage. So we're adding altmetrics content to the different pages so that researchers can see where all of that tweeting and blog posts and news outlets are coming for. So here you can just see a couple of altmetrics pages for different publications. Um, geographic coverage, which is very important for us. So the question is, how does this all sort of fit into our OSTP um, compliance? Our OSTP compliance was generated from our Undersecretary for Collections Interdisciplinary Support, um, which is where the library reports, and our, our DUSCIS gathered together a group of employees at the Smithsonian from the different units, the library, the archives, our chief information officer, to design a response to the OSTP policy and come up with a way that we could provide that type of information. So the basis for this was we decided it would cover both Smithsonian science and non-science materials. The Smithsonian scholarly press would be one of the key players in terms of managing the workflow of publications. We have been in conversation with Chorus and Shares in terms of working with them for all of this. Um, and all of it plays into the general desire for an increased open access to the Smithsonian content. So a couple of years ago, we were a, a signatory of the recent Berlin Declaration for Open Access, and this all fits together in that area. So one question, again, with the OSTP mandate is about data. Where does data fit in? Um, I'll tell Josh Greenberg the other day about this. He said, where does data fit in? I said, well, it doesn't really. We're sort of punting on the data portion right now, as are many people. So right now, what we are doing is including data sets for published materials within our repository system. But for ongoing research, we're trying to figure out a way to do this. And many of you know Thorny Staples, who works within our chief information officer, he used to be at the University of Virginia, et cetera. Um, Thorny is working on what he's calling Cydora, Smithsonian Institution Fedora Repository, and that's going to be for ongoing Smithsonian research. So we're currently in a, a beta version of the Cydora project, which will be a method to capture ongoing data from the Smithsonian researchers. And we're currently working on an entomology project as our test base. Library staff are working as sort of the docents along with the researchers on that. And we'll be moving that into a test instance of Fedora to do the data. If that all works out, that will be our data component for the OSTP compliance. And here's just a screenshot of the current um, behind the firewall Fedora installation. Um, as I mentioned, we are working with, with um, Chorus and um, Shares. Um, I like this slide. There's a picture. That's you may can't tell, but that's the space shuttle doing the overflight of the National Mall, and there's a panda on the top. And one of our scientific researchers, um, scientific directors, the head of the zoo, was telling the air and space director that really the best way to get publicity is if only we could put a baby panda on a space shuttle, and that would be the best way to bring out the sort of importance of Smithsonian research is flying pandas. So, so I want to bring together pandas. In. But importantly, what we're doing now is, as many people are, is we want to integrate the personal element as well as all of the other types of things that comp 
surprise research in that scholarly environment that OCLC has documented. So we are instituting a Vivo installation under the name of Smithsonian Profiles. It's currently in beta testing right now. We're importing all of the Smithsonian data, tying it into our grants research. It ties back research, grant research data ties back into the bibliographic data and a number of other sources. So this will enable us to provide a bigger holistic view of the Smithsonian research. Here's just some sample pages from that. And here's a sort of a not yet fully branded version of the Vivo pages. So what we like to think is that, um, as a, in the words of our first secretary, Joseph Henry, it's not really the stuff that you keep inside your walls of your institution that make it important. And at the Smithsonian, where we have 137 million objects in our collection, we have a lot of important stuff. But it's how we actually get that information and that content out to the greater world that actually defines the importance of the institution. So on behalf of all the Smithsonian staff, I'd like to thank you for your time today. And I'd also like to thank some of my staff, Alvin Hutchinson and Richard Naples, who you may know as the gift master from the Tumblr, um, for their, re their help on this, as well as the rest of the Smithsonian staff that have worked on Smithsonian Research Online for the last number of years. Thank you.